Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our last and final panel um, for the uh, Seed and Sprout series, the summer series on LGBTQ2S uh, parenting. Um, we're really excited for this. I uh, love all these people so dearly and have a lot of love and respect for these folks on this panel, and I'm very excited for all of you to hear um, the amazing ways that they show up as parents and in community. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to get into it because we are running a little bit late today. So um, I just want to thank everyone for joining, and if you're watching this later on, uh, please check out the rest of the series that has been recorded and part of the YouTube set. Um, it, we have really great uh, sessions on fertility, on different ways to become parents, on adoption fostering, on another panel actually that started on how, to, how people became parents. Um, so this panel today, we're actually going to talk about, okay, so you have a baby in your life, you have a kid in your life, you have a child in your life in some kind of way, what do you do now with them? <laughs> um, so what happens after you have this little person in your life? And they're just there, you know, um, what does that look like and, and what do we do? Um, ho we're hoping to have conversations today around things like daycare and families of origin and racism and homophobia and transphobia and the way that that shows up in the ways that we parent and come together. And also specifically, our, our, we, we want to talk specifically about what it's like to also be a BIPOC person um, in the parenting world um, and a queer and trans BIPOC person in particular and how those things can really shift how we um, enter parenting spaces, um, especially because they're so cishet and white um, and what that looks like. So um, yeah, so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, that today and then I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. Okay, and so before we begin today, we're going to uh, have Thunder Sharma start us off. This has been such an incredible opportunity that we've had um, to have Thunder open up every session for us in the, this series. Um, and it's particularly important for us uh, because Thunder is a youth. Uh, Thunder is a beautiful human uh, that we are so grateful to have share in these spaces with us, um, who is also invested in little people in community and family, um, and is a trans and two-spirit person who, um, is really uh, connected to so many different parts of little people and our families and the way that families are created, um, including my own daughter. So um, I'm really excited to have Thunder here to join us uh, to open us up to have this conversation around uh, co-parenting and all the legal stuff. Um, so I'll leave it up to uh, Thunder and I'm going to spotlight you, love, um, or pin you, and go right ahead. Am I pinned? There we go. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Thunder and I come from Saugeen First Nation. My pronouns are he, they. Um, I'm a 21-year-old post-secondary student, as some of you, if not most of you, probably know by now if you tuned in to the other videos. I'm going to be opening up um, with a healing song today. So the song is called Healing Hoop and comes from Maggie Paul. So... <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, we're here. 
much thunder and thank you for opening that was such a beautiful song uh, just share that uh, for me i'm here in toronto which is uh, currently the lens of the mississaugas of new credit um, also lands to the uh, honoshone here on wendat um, and uh, has been a place uh, that i've visited and ho been hosted on since I was born, I was born and raised here. Um, my people are from Trinidad and also East Africa. Um, but I, as a parent in particular, I think it is really important to think about how we, we foster and understand our relationships as settlers here or as people who are visiting here. Um, and for me, that's a really important piece to how I am a parent to my daughter. Um, and so, you know, thinking especially about the fact that, you know, this September 30th is coming up, I would also ask, you know, to, for you to think about how you're also having conversations with your children about this and, and not and why not um, and what our responsibilities are. Um, and for Indigenous families out there watching this or Indigenous parents to be, we have your back, we love you, we want to like support you in fostering family. Um, and we're with you on that process of decolonization. So um, yeah, I just wanted to start that and think about that in the conversations we're having as well and what that looks like for BIPOC people to be here, to create family here, um, and to also be, you know, coming up against this very real ongoing system of colonization against particularly Indigenous and Black people. Um, so yeah, just wanted to ground that in that this conversation and I'm really grateful for the people on this panel because I feel like a lot of your work as parents and also just in the world really reflects that process of decolonization and really centering BIPOC communities. And so, um, yeah, just sending a lot of gratitude for all of you, even from the jump. Um, I'm really grateful for all of you and thank you for joining us today. Um, okay, so let's get into it. Um, let's start. Uh, so, uh, um, the first question for us um, is uh, to tell us a little bit about you, um, you in particular as people, because you're still people outside of being parents, um, and then also uh, your family and well, you know who you want, how you describe yourselves, um, and whoever wants to start wants to start um, for feeling like they want to, um, or should I call people out? I don't know. I don't, I don't really mind starting. <laughs> I mean, well, well, the Wi-Fi is good, you know? <laughs> oh, I can't hear you anymore. Can you just say something real quick, Aruna? So that yeah, I oh, I muted, sure my, I I muted my, break it. I muted myself. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for, for having me join you. I'm really, really happy and excited to, to be here. Um, I really, really love talking about parenting a lot. Um, so my name is Stacia Stewart. Um, I parent three children. Uh, I co-parent two of my children with one person after we separated several years ago, um, and we have a separation agreement. And I co-parent one of my children with one person who is chosen family, um, where we chose to come together to co-parent and we were not in an intimate relationship. <clears throat> so um, definitely like a different, you know, blended family kind of structure. Um, two of my children are black and one child is uh, Sri Lankan Tamil. I have a partner as well of almost five years who I do not parent with. My partner has grown children and grandchildren and we welcomed a brand new grandchild two weeks ago who I was able to uh, doula into the world, which was a blessing. Uh, my children are now age 11 and 11 and 18. So the last two children are twins and my big child is off to university this year. Uh, some of my children have diagnosed disabilities as do I. 
We talk a lot about community and family and lineage, uh, culture and race um, a lot. I'm also a transracial adoptee and I'm fairly active in online black uh, transracial adoptee groups. Sometimes I've mentored families who have considered adoption. Uh, I grew up in a white family with white siblings in small towns in Ontario, Newfoundland uh, and Manitoba. And I've also spent time in Alberta, BC and the Yukon. <clears throat> My white parents were truck drivers. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, I, do, I did do a lot of um, uh, fertility uh, treatments. I did IVF and IUI uh, in my 20s. I did at-home insemination. Uh, I ran out of money at one point, was just kind of trying to get it on with a male friend who offered. I did all the things. Alas, um, that was not the path for me, and I did not get pregnant through those, those means. Um, our family is fairly frequently talking about um, the ways that family uh, and true family lineage, all that things intersect with other locations. Um, and outside of all things parenting um, as employment, I'm a birth postpartum and fertility doula, and I work a lot in black uh, and BIPOC focused birth work collectives. Um, and I also work at a community health center coordinating like a perinatal and parenting program. Um, I really, really, really love talking about parenting. And that's me. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, wow. Beautiful. Uh, who wants to go next? Um, I can. Or did somebody else have their hand up? Okay. Um, so my name is Bina, and I. Um, I've been parenting in different ways for a long time. And thank you so much, Stacia, actually for two things. One, for the amazing stuff that you just said. And two, um, through my partner, Helena, you gave us a bunch of Beyblades. So, <laughs> which were deeply appreciated in our house, mostly by Helena, but you know, that's another story. So um, uh, thank you so much for having me here, um, Aruna. That's so lovely. And it's really nice to see uh, so many folks that really make my heart shine. And uh, I know Vashti from a million years ago and stuff. So it's just really, really lovely to see people who always make me smile so much when we come across one another in community. Um, so I started parenting in 92 um, and my uh, ex-partner at the time uh, found out that she was pregnant and asked if I could co-parent with her and so uh, ironically in some ways it was around the same time that I found out that I had endometriosis and that I might never be able to uh, get pregnant stay pregnant and have kids biologically um, and so, and I was in my early twenties then, which was pretty devastating because I had always thought that I was going to have a whole lot of kids. Um, I'm, and just a little background to my, uh, family, I'm mixed. My father's from India, my mother's from Germany. And so, especially not having had a lot of mixed role models, I really, really thought it was so important to be able to share that story with kids. Um, so, uh, I co-parented, uh, with uh, my very, very good friend, um, for a number of years. And then as things change, I think it's really hard, especially if you're not in an intimate relationship, especially if you're not, uh, I mean, at that time, there weren't a lot of legal agreements around custody and things like that for queer parents, for folks who had even more you know, non-mainstream kinds of parenting arrangements. Um, around the same time, another good friend of mine had uh, a daughter and even though we didn't officially co-parent, um, that daughter who is now 27, uh, always says that I was part of her growing up, right? That I was one of the people who raised her and who helped her be the queer, uh, strong person that she is now, which is really wonderful. And I think that um, 
one of the one of the ways that we show up for one another in community, especially in queer community and queer trans community, is that parenting or caring for kids looks pretty different a lot of the time, right? And so I am actually grateful to my parents for always building community. They're not necessarily uh, supportive of my being queer, or they are now, but they weren't for a long time, but they always built community. And so for me, building community has just been a really natural thing. Um, in those two examples, um, my commitment was very much to the kids. So when our relationships changed, I still really wanted to be a part of the kids' lives, but resisted changing my relationships with the other parents, which is also really difficult as the non-biological parent. Um, but, uh, sorry, so I'm a little bit all over the place, um, but those two uh, grown-ups are still really an amazing part of my life. Uh, in my 30s, I tried to get pregnant in lots of different ways and had a bunch of miscarriages and it didn't work out. But as somebody who was going to be doing that on my own, I also turned my heart inside out around what kind of sperm donor to use. Because as somebody who's mixed, I couldn't find there weren't a lot of options and I didn't have a lot of money. There weren't a lot of options around trying to find somebody who was the same mix as me so that I could you know, share that story in particular. And I think I made that so complicated for myself um, that it became a huge part of doubting myself around whether or not if my kid wasn't the same mix as me, I mean, even if a kid came out of my body, would I still be able to share those stories in a particular way? And then living with disabilities and chronic pain and that kind of stuff, there's even more sort of complexity around deciding whether or not you deserve to have kids, right? And so I think that that was really hard. Um, and uh, then I met somebody who, uh, we were in an open relationship and their primary partner uh, got pregnant. And for me, that was a super huge trigger. And so I needed to really think about that, um, about whether or not I could be in that relationship with those possible ruptures and losses and things like that again. Um, but, you know, love for kids wins out. <laughs> um, uh, we do all sorts of, um, we do all sorts of things that challenge our hearts and we just make it work. Um, more recently, and so there's this amazing seven-year-old who is in my life and I don't see them as much as I would like to, um, but that's not anybody's fault. Um, and then with my partner now, um, we went through fertility things and again, and they didn't work out the way that we had hoped, but we are foster parents. And, uh, and I don't mean that as a sort of secondary option, um, but the foster care system is fucked up, right? We know that. It is a colonizer's tool there is so much violence and dysfunction within it. And yet it's also really important for people who have good politics to be a part of it because the kids who need support need support, right? And so for me, I think that we can challenge the system and also provide a safe place for kids to land. And so we have been fostering for three years. Um, we've had 12 kids um, be held in our home. We have uh, continued connections with a number of them. Um, and one little guy has been with us since he was four months old. He came uh, in March 2020, so right at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, or the lockdown for the pandemic, and um, he's going to stay with us. He's going to be a part of our family uh, through permanent uh, custody. And the reason that we're not adopting him is so that 
there's more of a door open for his biological parents to feel like they're part of the family so that not all change has to mean loss. Um, his parents are super young and love him. And so if we can help show that family gets to be defined in lots of different ways. And just because we're in a space to love him in a particular day-to-day -day kind of way, it doesn't mean that they are counted out in some way. And so to hold that space, to hold it open, to open our hearts is so crucial. Um, but sometimes it also breaks our hearts. We also had somebody living with us who was really triggered by babies. And, um, and she's seven and sh she was flying into rages because she couldn't handle the sound of the babies and she missed so much nurturing at that time. And so the decision was made for her to live somewhere else, but we're continuing to be in her life. And so again, really trying to find that line. I'm sorry, I've been probably talking too long, um, but I think that the complexity of parenting, the complexity of showing up for one another is held in lots of different ways in my life. And I really, really love all of the different ways that it's held in other people's lives. I also, um, uh, I apprenticed as a midwife in a million years ago. And so I also really appreciate the idea of uh, the, the way that we create space for, um, anyway, for the birthing of different kinds of families too. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you for that, Bina. I think, I think it really, it's like the queerest way to do it is to like, yeah. Is, is what you just described, right? Like, <laughs> like that's kind of like the in and outs of all of the relationships and all the nuances of ways that we love and like are in each other's lives. I think it's really, yeah, like what Jay just said, it's like so beautiful and is the best reflection of like what we bring to the world, you know? Is like, you have so much love to like offer and give and nurturing and, and that's shown up so many different ways for you and how you parent. I think that's like the queerest thing I've heard. Like, <laughs> like for a long time <laughs> so well, and for me it's also really like that whole like change doesn't mean loss like our walls in our uh in our house are covered in photos of the kids in our lives and they're in our lives in lots of different ways which is hard to describe to people outside of the queer trans community right because people say well i don't understand <laughs> Um, but it's so amazing. We're so, I'm so grateful for the hard work of that complexity. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Thank you. I think we're all there with you. We're all like, yay. <laughs> um, who wants to go next? Jay or Vashti Tina? Yeah, we'll go next. I just want to say this before we start. Um, you know, thank you so much for sharing. I guess we've known each other for a million years. <laughs> and, um, it's always so um, amazing to get to know, not get to know, but know the, the reasons why you've known people for a million years, right? So thank you. And also, Stacia, thank you. You've only heard your report of just under a million years. Um, <laughs> um, so thank you both for sharing your stories. It's really amazing. And it's, um, um, it, we feel very honored to be included in this panel with um, some really amazing people um, first and parents second or as well or yeah so thank you thank you Aruna for organizing this and getting us getting us in here yeah I echo all of that thank you so much and I really appreciate um, the the level of um, deepness that everyone is bringing to this panel thank you so much Dina and Station and it, it inspires me to try and be as open as I can be in sharing um, our story. Um, I guess I'll just start. Um, my name is Fatima Mullen. This is with my partner, Vashti Prasad. This year will be our 20th um, oh. anniversary. That's almost a million. <laughs> so that's almost a million. <laughs> um, so we've been on this journey together for a while. Um, we have two children. We're going to start before we got together. My journey started before we got together. That's true, actually. Yeah. Um, 
I'll get to that in a second. But uh, so we have two children, Aishani and Jaleel, and um, they are the center of our world. And um, we'll talk about a bit more about them in a little while. But, uh, but in terms of us, um, as Vasu reminded me, uh, she's constantly reminding me things about my life because I have a terrible memory. <laughs> but um, I did actually, uh, wa I, I wanted to have children um, forever, it feels like. And so I started trying to have kids with a very good friend of mine when I was um, in my early 20s. And we tried a few times. Um, it didn't end up working out. And then Vashi and I got together um, shortly, like kind of overlapping that process. And at the time, we decided that um, to stop trying. So we did at, at that point stop trying. Um, and then Vashi and I, right from the beginning of our relationship, um, wanted to have children together and full time. So, um, I wanted to talk about a couple of things. I mean, the other panelists have brought up some really important um, context and um, issues, and, and I really appreciate what they share. I myself wanted to talk a little bit about um, families of origin, because that's been a huge part of my story. Uh, my family is, uh, so my, my background is um, Gujarati, so my family um, came here in the 70s from India, from Gujarat, and um, my family is Muslim. And, I still like obviously identify as Muslim, but I'm not practicing Muslim myself, and um, that's for a particular reason. Um, but my family is very Orthodox, and uh, so I grew up in a very Orthodox um, Muslim family, and came out quite young. I came out when I was in high school. Um, so for me, my relationship with my family has always been very complicated in terms of sexuality. Um, and also gender uh, stuff. And I never, I didn't end up, both my parents have passed away, and I never came out to um, either of them, although I'm fairly certain my dad knew what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> By the time, um, like my dad was, was around for uh, Bosque and I together, and both the kids being born, and he wasn't, you know, like he, I'm sure he knew what the deal was. Um, although we never spoke about it openly. And that was a conscious decision on, on my part, and people make their own decisions about whether they feel the need to come out um, and who to come out to and how to come out. And for me, it was, um, I felt that I didn't need it enough to do that to my parents in terms of what then they would have had to struggle with um, and come to terms with because they were. Well, at this point, it would have been my father. My mother passed away when I was younger. Um, and he was a very religious man, very orthodox man, and very, like, in a very particular way. You can be religious and, and queer and, like, all the rest of it. But for my father, he was very traditional. Um, and he, it would have been painful for him. And I didn't feel like I needed to, um, to do that. Like I, I was, I was good with my relationship with him and then how things work. So I didn't actually come out to him. But I think that for me, that I still kind of think about and have more complicated feelings about is the relationship that our children have with my side of the family. Because like, essentially they don't have a relationship with my side of the family. And that brings me a lot of grief. I myself don't have a very like solid relationship with my side of the family and I did come out to my brother and complicated things happened and um, there was a period of, of um, being shut out um, essentially disowned but not in so many words um, and I didn't want and Bosch and I talked about this as well but I, I, I didn't want to subject my kids to potential um, homophobia, queerphobia, however you want to put it, coming from my family when they're really little. <laughs> they, I, didn't, I didn't think that that would be something that would be fair to them or productive for them or it would have been traumatic for them. So I made the decision and I, I, can't, predict, I can't predict what would have happened, but that was my feeling that they would at some point or another 
be subjected to religious sermons about how their family was not okay. And I didn't want I didn't want that to happen. So I made the conscious decision to remove myself from my family and, and there's a lot of grief there around that. And I think that the children also I mean, they kind of understand at this point. They're twelve and ten. Um, they're beginning to you know, like I mean, we've had conversations with them about real things since they were very little. And um so I think they kind of get why they they don't know their uncle and they don't know their cousins. But I think they also experience grief around it. Um and that saddens me. Um but that's so that's my origin story. I'll let Tosh talk a little bit about um her side of the family has been amazing. They're very supportive, very welcoming, and um and we are, you know, like any other family to them. Like we are who we are and Bashi's parents have their grandchildren and that's a like that's there's no um artifice there. Mm -hmm. So um my um my family is from Trinidad, um and I have two older sisters who um also have two kids each. So in total my parents have six grandkids. And as Prima said, from pretty much the beginning when we first got together, we had been talking about wanting to have kids. Um I had always wanted to have kids. Um, didn't know how it was gonna happen because I knew that I wouldn't be the one actually having kids, so I knew that I'd have to be with someone that would want to have kids. And as it turned out, <laughs> it, worked it, out. it worked out. So here we are, 20 years, almost 20 years later, with two kids of our own. Um, so yeah, so as Tima said, you know, my family has been pretty amazing um, with our family. Um, it hasn't always been like that for me um, as an individual. Um, uh, growing up, um, I didn't come out until I, to my family until I was much older. Um, I didn't end up coming out to myself until I was like in my early twenties. Um, and I didn't come out to my my family until I was about twenty eight. Um, and just because I, I knew that there wasn't going to be a lot of support there. Um, however, over the years, uh, my, my parents have done a lot of work on outside of me, um, and I've done my own work as well in terms of how I relate to them. Um, so we are in a place now, in a place now with, with my parents um, and my siblings where um, we're, we're good. Like, my my parents are like amazingly supportive, um, not just to Fatima and myself, but also our kids. Um, there are times I'm kind of like, well, where was all of this when I was a kid? But that's another story. <laughs> um, but but I'm very I'm very grateful and um, for my parents and um, uh, the 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 love that they 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 bring to our family and. Um, the love they have for our children. Not to me, they don't, they're not like, they don't, Ashani and Julio aren't the grandkids of, or aren't the children of their queer daughter. They're just their grandkids. It's, it's just, um, and so how we ended up having kids is that we ended up doing it through a, a sperm bank. So it's an unknown donor. Um, and it's really interesting because you know, um, I think pre previous to the team and I having kids together, I always felt like I'm not gonna feel like the kids are really mine unless you know this feels like I share you know blood with them, which was it's just ridiculous. Um, but that's the piece that has been put like we're so conditioned with that. But this is what fam this is this is what this right here in this little box, this is where families split. And anything outside of that is a family. Um and I think that it's done a big disservice to a lot of people who um haven't that don't have community, that don't have other people around them, um, to tell them that it's okay, that like family is love and that's it. 
Um, so I think that there are there are a lot of people that feel that they, they, they cannot start a family, they cannot have a family for the myriad of reasons why so many of us are unable to or feel that we're unable to have family. Um, so that was a piece that I that existed within me, um, which very quickly vanished. Um, and it also it's amazing to see that that doesn't exist either within like my extended family, within my, my, my parents, my sisters, my other nieces and nephews. Like you're just family. You could like it's it's that it's love, right? Um, there is nothing that separates any of us from each other. Um, so that was that. That's a really good piece. That that I'm because as Fatima said with her family and the reasons why we um, can't have them in our lives, um, it helps knowing that there is, you don't have to worry about any kind of separation with my family. Um, and I don't know, what else do you want to talk about? Well, if you guys have any other things, you, if you want to tell us about your kids, their ages, um, and then we'll get we're gonna get into like the hard stuff that's coming up for sure because uh, there's lots. But I also want to introduce Jay and myself yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll wait. Yeah. Okay, Jay, did you want to introduce yourself? Thank you for that. Sure. <laughs> um, my name is Joaquin uh, Jay for some some special people, <laughs> um, and uh, pronouns he him. And I lost my kid somewhere in the house. Uh, she just got sick of it. Um, <laughs> know that your stories are were great, <laughs> um, uh, but she's also five. Um, anyways, I feel like I'm the most boring here. Uh, my name is Joaquin again. I I am from Dominican Republic. Uh, I identify as a trans masculine person. Um, I have two kids, one is five, Frankie, and then I also have a fun, fun newborn, five month old, Vida, uh, which is out cottaging for the weekend <laughs> with his mom. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I, I co-parent Frankie with someone else uh, and uh, we've gone through, it hasn't been as beautiful as queer people like to make it be. Uh, it's been a, like very challenging, um, like uh, sort of like uh, custody, uh, you know, l like lots of uh, having to go through mediation. Um, it's been pretty nasty at, at times and it's been better in the last couple of years, but it, it was really hard for a while there. Um, I still don't spend as much time as I want with Frankie. Uh, so it's been really hard. Um, but um, uh, so my other, I started in a relationship and I have uh, a five month old. Both are uh, used uh, different, I use different donors. So, uh, be, so the other two parents were the birthing parents. Um, I I wanted to carry my own my own eventually, but I I was on testosterone for too long. So I uh, without so I guess I started having problems with my uterus. I I had to have a hysterectomy before I was ready to have children. Um, yeah, I think that's that's pretty much what I got to say. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, sure. Yeah. Yay! You're all so amazing. Um, <laughs> I'm so I'm gonna do a little thing, something a little different that I haven't done in the last few panels. Um, is that I'm also gonna introduce myself, which I'd never have done before. Like I never thought to do it. <laughs> um, but I'm also a parent. Um, and so I am a solo parent by choice. I identify as an autonomous parent. Um, and uh, I am a parent, I was like, how old is she now? She's 18 months old, adjusted. 
um, and 21 months actual. So the reason why she has two ages is because she was born uh, super early. So my daughter uh, came literally like feet first rushing into the world um, when she was 24 weeks gestation um, out of the 40. So if people are listening who are pregnant, you can imagine, you know, you're supposed to be pregnant until you're 40 weeks. Um, she came out at 24. Um, the viability age for any, any fetus, um, is 20. Well, it's, they're trying to push it up now, which is great. Um, but at the time, uh, viability was 23 weeks, like just under 23 weeks. So if you were like 22 weeks and five days, they might try to resuscitate, but anything be below that you were, you were shit out of luck. Um, so they, yeah, so I had to make the very scary choice of potentially not um, letting them resuscitate Surya. That's the name of my daughter. Um, and, but she luckily made it to 24. Um, we were in the NICU for uh, three months, both at Sunnybrook and then at Humber River. And then I took her home and then it was just being a weird term parent like everybody else. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, I did IVF. Um, I chose to do it by myself. I had had pulp printers in the past that, you know, had talked about wanting kids, but they were awful. And then folks who knew that they didn't want kids, which I really appreciated and were very great about, you know, I don't want babies. This is not going to work. Um, also very appreciated. Um, and so I was like, you know what, I'm not going to wait. I have been parenting in different ways, um, similar to Bina in a variety of different capacities, whether that's with other people's kids or my, my siblings at some points, I would have considered been considered a parent. Um, and different ways that I parent people in community and also, uh, you know, the little gabies that are around sometimes that are like, wow, you're a DJ. Let me talk to you. Um, tell me everything, you know, <laughs> so, you know, different ways that we parent each other. Also, I feel like also doesn't get, um, I feel like I've been parented by most of you at some point. Um, so yeah, I think that there's uh, different ways that I've parented and been parented. And I really appreciate the ways that those have manifested. Um, but yeah, so I'm a, like, for me as a person, my people are, as I said earlier, from Trinidad and also from um, East Africa, Tanzania. Um, I come from like a very like Trinidadian household. We're very, very, very Caribbean. Um, and so, but somehow what gets twisted up in that narrative, especially around like how homophobia and racism and anti-blackness manifests is that people think that that means that we can't be out and we can't be ourselves and we can't be who we are, um, which has not been the case. I feel like I've had a lot of great experiences with my Caribbean family and Trinidadian family in particular, and we queer Caribbean people are everywhere. Um, so accessing culture for my kid has been really a beautiful process of like allowing for her to like know uh, about our food, our people, our, our music, which is the best music. Um, and so thinking about how to connect her as like a queer spawn to not only the queer community, but also like this big, like multitude, vast Caribbean community as well. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. Um, and I'll be kind of like tapping on a little bit about what it's like from a solo parent, autonomous parent by choice um, to the conversation, but um, I'm mostly here to just also, so I'll be take having two hats for today. But um, thank you for your intros. Um, it is such an honor to be here with all of you and to hear your stories. And um, Fatima Vashti in particular, like you guys talked, we're gonna talk about favorite things to be a parent, but I think your conversation around like some of that hard stuff around families of origin, I think is a really good place to actually like continue on from. Um, in particular, like the hard things that come up as queer and trans parents. What are some things that you, you know, you've touched on a lot already around, um, you know, having to have those conversations with yourself around like, do I ha let these kids access their family and potential violence? Or do I like how do we protect our kids from that, right? Because that is a very much a reality still for many, particularly BIPOC folks um, around how that homophobia and transphobia manifests um, in our lives and in these kids' lives. So what are some other hard things that have come up um, as queer and trans parents um, for, for all of you? And feel free, whoever wants to add on, jump in. I think, one thing I was when you know I really appreciated what you were sharing, um, Fatima, about your family, and I I think 
um, for myself. So I really, really wanted my children to grow up with cousins. I was really like kind of a bit fixated on that. And my parents, um, my adoptive parents, they're both in very, very um, Christian family. I have several aunts who are nuns and I really thought, I think, I think that I thought, well, how do I know if, how do I know the potential of anybody to come around? Like, how do I know if it's going to be horrible at first, but better later? And that was something that I really struggled with, you know, and I had, and, and I really thought about, well, is it fair to sort of go in and spend time with family with my hope? that some, some of them might come around. But meanwhile, my children are babies and they're taking in all of this mm. messed up energy and messaging. And um, that was something that I think was, I experienced it as a lot of torment because I really thought, but, I, but then I'm not gonna know like who, who in the family is gonna show up and rise, right? And so, you know, and, and some of it, I still, I still reflect on some of those things. And, you know, there were times where all the cousins were together and my, my a relative went out and bought all the children presents and handed them out and didn't give any to any of my children. And Ow. they watched. And then, and then my, and then Ow. another family member went running out to the, to the mall to get present and then came back and gave my, just like, it was just like, just stupid, stupid shit that I was like, yeah. Okay. So, you know, and then I'm just busy in my head, right? Like obsessing about repair. Like, how do I make sure that they're not traumatized and all that kind of stuff? So I do, I do really think about like, you know, that space of how you sort of support them. Because as it turns out, um, you know, some, some family members did rise and they did go back to those relatives and they did say like, you better show up or get out kind of. And it, it did end up being a whole family kind of, well, that was a blowout, let's be real. It was a, it was a family blowout. Um, and, then, and, then, and then that particular relative um, wrote to me, but it was a few years later. Um, mm. she, wrote, she wrote to me um, asking me if I would have her back in, in, in her life. Um, and I, you know, I don't know, I just, I feel like it's a, it's, it's hard to know those things. And I think in the interim, what I ended up doing was creating community around them and sort of giving, instead of relying on that external, like what is family to, to you and waiting for people to, you know, work it out kind of thing. I just tried to give my children the tools that they needed to show up for themselves and know like who they were and da, da, da. so, you know, it, it, it definitely feels like some kind of like wave that you're, you're that I, I felt like I was trying to ride because at the same time, I felt like in my context, these were also family that I was having my own complicated relationships with. And I think that um, sometimes it, it did manifest as, as me just being like, anyways, this is all racist bullshit, I'm out. You know, it's sometimes, um, but I do think that, um, looking at them now and talking about those times they're like whatever moms you're overthinking like we good you know like they're just like they're really like look at my fabulousness you know but you know i think um that repair and not wanting them to internalize these things is really it's real right that concern is real and um yeah so yeah i just really really appreciated what you what you shared about that because it really made me think about that piece and that's an ongoing it's an ongoing relationship right like that's an ongoing question an ongoing piece my parents also passed away um um years back and you know oftentimes parents become that link to family right like often that's such a central like attachment and a central um thing and so it really made me kind of think back like oh, okay like you're not here as the thing that brings us all to this this, this point of connection, um, what does that mean? And um, all of that. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I wanted to share. Thanks, yeah. Lisa. You know, like everything you're saying totally resonates with me. Um, and one of the things, so your kids are saying, we're good, um, you're overthinking. Well, maybe they're good because you're overthinking, right? So is it despite it or because of it? <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> it's probably because of it, because I'm obsessed and I'm always talking to them. Like, but do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> One thing I did want to um, just also add was that, like this, the the journey isn't over, right? Like so. Um, like our kids are 12 and 10, um, and as they get older, they might want to reach out on their own um, to their cousins. Because my brother, I have one sibling, my brother, and um, he has uh, three kids, and two of them are adults now. And as um, our kids get older, um, they they can be able to then like they they're like they're very conscious that like um, around. Um, oppression, intersecting oppressions, um, their own identities. Uh, and so as they get older, I think that they'll have more of a capacity to deal with anything that comes up um, if they do choose to um, engage with their cousins. And I actually am not in touch with my, my uh, niece and nephew, so I actually don't know what they're like. Maybe that potential is there. Um, like I know what my community is like, and I know how they were raised and what they probably are like but I actually don't know because I myself am a product of that community and look at me so if, if I am who I am coming from that community perhaps they are also um there's always going to be rebels within that context so um and I actually you know um I have a little tiny hope that maybe they do choose to connect or try to connect with their cousins because I I can connect through them so that would be a, a plus for me as well and it was also the same thing around cousins, because like I grew up with like a lot of cousins, and we, I wanted that because my, my sisters, both my sisters' kids are much older. Um, they're all they're all adults now, um, but I wanted our kids to have that, you know. But so what what we've done is exactly what you're saying. What you're saying, Stacia, is that you know Aruna's daughter is their cousin, right? We have other friends, like all of our friends that have kids, their kids are their cousins. Like, so our kids actually do have like a whack load of cousins as well, right? So, um, yeah. Uh, Jay and Bina, did you have anything you wanted to add around stuff that's come up, hard stuff, not, you know, things to navigate? Sure. Um... I did unmute it, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's so interesting around cousins, hey? Um, we grew up, so my parents uh, didn't think they could have kids, and that made it easier for them to be an interracial couple in Germany in 1965. Um, and then when, when my mom got pregnant with my sister, who's the eldest, they said, oh, we don't think that we can raise mixed kids in Germany or in India. And so they came here to Canada, which obviously was sunshine and lollipops. No racism here, no issues. Um, no, and, but they couldn't go anywhere else. Um, but what they did was um, they had a circle of friends who were also interracial couples and all of those kids were our cousins. Right, and because our families, we were, for the longest time, we were the only ones here. We didn't have any blood relatives uh, in Canada. So um, I really appreciate the fact that I've never cared so much about blood, like being related to people by blood as the only way to define family. And so our cousins were our cousins, right? And we called everybody auntie and uncle or because my mom's German, Tante and Onkel. And they were predominantly Bengali people. And so us calling them German, Antina. <laughs> anyway. Um, but I think that, you know, in Germany, my cousins are all like super tall and platinum blonde hair and, you know, blue eyes <laughs> and stuff. And in India, I'm lighter skinned than a lot of them also. <laughs> shockingly one of the tallest cousins um but we have like thousands of relatives um my father is the third youngest of a lot of kids a couple of his brothers their wives had a lot of kids and so i actually am the absolute youngest in my generation so all of my cousins are older than me and so i've always also hung out with 
you know, my nieces and nephews and my grandchildren in the Bengali way of doing things. Um, but the way in which I have parented, um, I think because there was homophobia in my family, I became very distant. And I have this entire life that most of my relatives don't even know about. And so even though I've you know, gone to India and spent time there and lived there and I'm very close with people, only some of them, only some in the generation after me, uh, have known about the fact that I have parented for a long time. And, and I think that the way in which our own stories are held by people that our hearts can trust um, is really important. And the way that we define things is really important. So the, um, the awesome person who says that I helped raise her, and I believe that as well, um, I call her my heart's child, right? And she calls me her heart's mother. And so again, like finding language to hold and honor where those threads are is so important. Um, you know, the uh, oldest kid that I co-parented, she uh, still calls me Bina mommy, but she has explained our relationship to people as my being her godmother and not like, so even within that, which I'm really glad to be connected with her. I love her so much but so much of my own story is erased, right? And we, we don't have any control over what other people's stories are about our relationships with them. Um, with fostering, uh, so many people say to us, oh, we could never do that, we would get attached. I'm like, do you think we don't get attached? Like, <laughs> we have to, right? And even within fostering, people don't talk about attachment or connected parenting and that kind of stuff. And so doing that, with kids whose trauma you don't know about, really. They just come in and then you have to try to figure out how to do that. Um, we get so attached and they are part of the family. And I think that that's bewildering to our relatives, right? My partners and my families, because they, they're like, oh, okay, so this kid, so we will pour love into this kid. Oh, now they're gone. <laughs> okay, this kid will pour love into this kid. And I think for, there's so much grief and there's so much joy in our lives. And to choose to have that soft place to land for as long as a kid is in your home is really hard. And to love them wherever their trauma has put them and to love them when all of their trauma triggers our trauma um and so i think that that's really hard but it's also amazing um i know that we have learned so much parenting together for the first time as foster parents <laughs> um has meant that we have needed to have conversations that i'm really glad we've been able to have but i don't know how many other people have them Right? Like there's no guidebook for any of this kind of parenting that we do or our relationships to our family. Um, but it's a pretty cool, heart strong kind of way to live. I don't know. I feel like that's the that's the thread throughout all these conversations is like there is just so much. We just have to love ourselves through this. Um, yeah. And I think that's parenting, no matter how little people come into your life, you have to just like the triggering piece is so real. <laughs> Like the ways that this kid triggers me. Oh my God. Like it is some next level triggers. I thought my mom triggered me. This kid took it to like a next level. <laughs> and the whole like not following them into their chaos. Oh yeah. is a yeah. huge deal, right? Which, Absolutely. Man, yeah, we're all very opinionated. Um, but I also want to say that the <laughs> reason that I am so grateful for opportunities for us to come together like this is that it's really isolating. Mm -hmm. even with all of the work that we've done in the queer community and stuff like that we don't get a chance to sit down and talk about this stuff right yeah. so my heart is so full right now um because we 
get to connect. So thank you so much. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. Um, it's true. I feel like it also with pandemic too, and the ways in which, I mean, Jay, you have the newest, I think, baby of us all. So I'm sure your level of isolation is like next level. Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear from you around like what have been some hard things that have happened and come up for you. You talked a little bit about your co-parenting situation before. Um, feel free to share whatever you'd like. Um... I think through COVID, uh, parenting a little one hasn't been so hard because I feel like I like my space. <laughs> and uh, I feel like people have kind of stay away a little bit. So that has been good. Um, I, I like having, I think we have made, being able to make room for the people that we actually feel like we need to have around and we feel comfortable having in our home. So, um, and see the people that we love and that's being, that's been really good. Uh, I mean, to answer your question surrounding like uh, being a transparent and the hardest things for me, to be honest, is that uh, it's, it's a little bit of what everyone had to say, but I think it, the hardest thing is like parenting differently from the way I was parent. Um, I, I think that uh, it takes a lot out of me. I'm like emotionally so sad. It's like even my kids get annoyed by me because they ask me a question and I'm like, wait, I need to think about this because I need to think about, I need to go through all my processes of like, okay, this is what my mom will say. This is what my dad will say. This is what most people will say. And I need to be like, okay, this is what I would say. <laughs> so it's like a process. And she's like, dad, I asked you a question. Answer. And <laughs> I was like, just give me a minute. <laughs> um, and that happens uh, all around and, um, um, I, I think I always do a con like a warning. I'm like, okay, uh, just give me a minute. I'm I'm thinking about this. Uh, and um, I I I grew up with like you know, especially with a little baby. Um, you know, I think my partner and I are, are very focused on on uh, being responsive parents, which which my other co-parent I did with with Frankie a lot. Um, I think because I'm working from home now, I'm being more part of that instead of, I used to work restaurants before, so I was away a lot. Um, so being, working from home now, uh, which is great for COVID, right? Like that's another thing, thank you COVID. Um, uh, uh, in a way is that I'm able to, to uh, be able to stay home and be, be flexible about my parenting. So uh, being responsive to a little one, it, it's a lot of work. Um, it's he's been gone like I don't know, like ten hours, and I've done so many projects. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> anyways, I feel like uh, yeah, like I, I think the hardest thing for me is it's it's also like uh um repairing thing from outside forces you know like frankie comes home and he's like dad you know my friend tells me all oh, all boys have penises and i'm like you know to, to have a penis and she's like no and i'm like okay so that's not true <laughs> um so i think a lot of reparenting uh around like being trans and queer and what does that mean and like uh, uh, you know in the home uh, uh, especially I, I I live in a small town I live in uh, well not a city uh, uh, Peterborough so there's not a lot of like people of color or uh, trans people queer people it's very small so I'm continuously having to re reprogram my kid from when they come from school or even just outside on the street so it's it's very different uh you know than being in a big city and they get exposed to so many beautiful things and so many beautiful people and different experiences so here is very much like you know it's 
cis, heteronormative, you know, very nuclear family, very religious. So yeah, anyways, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I think for, I think what I know of like all of you and the ways that you parent is also you've created community, creating community has been such a huge part of how you parent, right? Um, and I, I, I feel like for, and, and being a part of all of your communities has been such a gift because it also has allowed for me to like really imagine for myself as an autonomous parent, when I went into it, I was like, the only way that I'm going to have a kid is if I guaranteed have people with me on this, um, who are my bio family, but also not my, they're also my chosen family, you know, the people who I have in community who are going to stand by me and my little person, you know, when things get rough. And because I don't have like a, a person that's come co-parenting with, it's actually really necessary, right? Um, I currently have a partner who is amazing, but um, they have their own two children and are not co-parenting with me. And so they have their own kids and parenting. So you might hear some toys now, my kid's up. Um, and so, yeah, so also like navigating the ways in which, you know, you also as, a, as an autonomous parent have to like really um, can be consistent about like your autonomy as a parent. Um, and I feel like a lot with parents and with like other parents at like these new daycare thing and I, I just put her in daycare so now I'm getting into this whole like having to ad, ad, like address and talk to other parents about like oh your kid watches tv that's like oh they shouldn't be doing that before too I'm like do you want to come over and hang out with her while I like you know like have a shower like what do you what do you mean <laughs> so like this there's a lot of judgment um in cishet world parenting which all of you warned me about. And um, I, yeah, and I took very seriously, but um, yeah, it's very intense. And so I think like, that's the hardest part for me is like a lot of the, and so ableist. Yes, Stacia, absolutely. Yeah, so ableist um, and classist, you know, like I don't have money for, so someone at the, at, the, <laughs> at the park recently was like, this is my au pair. And I was like, what is that? um what is an au pair and she this was a queer couple this was like a white lesbian couple in the in the in east york i mean i live in east york right? yes baba um and they were like oh yeah like we usually don't come to the park because we have an au pair and i was like i don't even know what that is i had to google it so i was like oh this is what an au pair is cool i don't have money to like get someone from like france or something to come and live with me and hang out with my kid like that's not happening um, and so, yeah, thinking about how like those, it's okay, okay I'll take it. Sorry. Oh, she just wants to see everybody. Um, so, you know, those kinds of things and how, I feel like all you're hearing is this. Sorry. Um, just thinking about how that's like the only, there's different ways of being present for your kids and parenting and, you wanna say hi? And, uh, and I think that's also the hardest part is like thinking about how it, okay it is to show up how you need to and also not be prepared. Like I'm never prepared for her throwing up all over her crib and then on the way out of like trying to go somewhere, you know, like those are, parenting is really hard and like queer parenting is really hard. And then being all the other things that we are in the world on top of parenting is always just constantly coming up and I think that's where community for me has been so important. Um, online community as well, because I had it through, through COVID. Um, texting all of like my friends and people in my life being like, oh my God, this just happened. Um, that's been really important for me. And so, yeah, I think for me, community has been like a really important piece of trying to, um, to deal with the things that have come up that have been really hard. Um, but also the pressure on parents. That's been the hardest part for me around feeling like I'm failing her all the time, constantly. Um, and that I made the wrong choices, that I shouldn't have done this, that I maybe should have waited, or maybe I should let someone co-parent with me. Like uh, all of it constantly, I'm just like always feeling like I'm failing her. And um, the triggers that you were talking about earlier, that comes up and makes me feel even worse about it. So yeah, but she's doing okay, she's alive. <laughs> yeah. Keep the children alive is basically my motto. Keep the children you know this. alive. Yeah. You know this about me. You know this. Right? Keep them alive. <laughs> we have to be gentle with ourselves. Yeah. Right? Like, we have to, like, the world is a complicated and often horrible place. 
and um, all of these, these things that we're talking about today are not easy. So I think that as much as there's a lot of judgmental people in the world, we sometimes are our own worst judges, right? And, um, and I also wanted to just add um, to the, the conversation about community. I wanted to talk about it uh, from like a little bit of a different perspective, more in terms of like, of, for me personally, like after, um, after Aishani was born, I felt that, and it happened really slowly and in a very insidious way, I found myself um, losing my own sense of identity outside of being a parent. And it got to a point where I was like, who am I? <laughs> I'm Aishani and Julio's mom, yes, but who, what else? Like, it, it's so easy to be all consumed with the role of parenting, um, that you don't, um, you don't continue the things that, the other things that make you yourself, right? And, and I found that, for me, that was a real reality, that it, it and also because, like, your children are your, your everything, right? So you want to do everything you can for them. And for us, I think that, that I, I'll speak for myself, but I think that we are all, I was also, to some degree, like a protectionist, right? Like, I, we, I didn't want to leave our children with other people, even if they were people like I trusted. And also at the time that we had when, when our kids were young, the community that we have has changed, like, dramatically since then. Um, a lot more of our friends have kids now than, than then. And um, when we had kids, we didn't, I don't think any of our other friends had kids, mm -hmm. um, our, our close friends, our community, our children, family. And so within that context, it was very um, easy to become isolated as parents. Because and it's, but it's also, it's not just that, but then also um, the group of friends we had, um, the socializing that we often did involved going out to clubs or bars or drinking and stuff like that. So it wasn't, so it was we couldn't also, take the kids with us. Yeah. So it was also very different. <laughs> yeah. It was also a very different um, uh, dynamic within our friend group. And so I just want to say that one of the things in terms of like, okay, what comes next? You're a parent now. Being intentional about yourself your, and maintaining your own interests and autonomy is very important and something that I've just started doing recently. Um, and our kids are six ten as well. So it's, it's, I think that if, um, if you can think about that, from when they're born, like it, it would be like it, and it's not. It, it's better for you, but it's also better for the kid, yeah. right? Because yeah. like if you're not taking care of yourself, it's uh, that much more difficult to take care of the little one. Yeah, no, it is. It is. That's crazy. Like you have to be very intentional about creating that community and making sure that you have those people around. Because it was. It, it actually became very difficult. When Jaleel was born, it was four months after Jaleel was born that became his dad passed away. Um, and so it, there was just a lot. There was a lot. And I think that that, that piece for us also, for dad passing away, Jaleel being born, it, we, were, we were overwhelmed by a lot that was going on. And I think because of that, we sort of pulled away and into our own, our own hole. Right, and it took us it took us a good two years to start digging our way out of that hole, um, and to you know to start reaching out. Um, so, and and yeah, it 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 had repercussions for us as individuals. It had repercussions for us as a couple, and it had repercussions for us as parents. So definitely, um, you know, it's like oh. I, you know, I can. I don't need anyone else. It's like, no, you do, because as everyone on this panel has said, raising raising kids is the most amazing, beautiful, rewarding. It teaches you love in so many different ways that you will never know. But it's also scary as hell. It also, it, as you know, people have said, it's like it's the, the trigger, like so many different things. So none of us can actually do this on our own. We do need that. We need people around us to hold us up and support us. And you know, as Stacia was saying earlier, we need people to show up, right? 
Yeah, and um, Sabina, I see your hand. One second, I just want to add something. And for folks who are, don't have kids in their life right now that are watching this or are friends of parents or whatever, that also means showing up for parents in your life, right? Um, I think that also a lot of folks, especially when I came out of the NICU, didn't know how to support me and was just like, I don't know, especially pet people without, I'm specifically talking about my friends that didn't have kids. And it was like really hard, but I was just like, I just need you to show up. I just need you to actually just like come over and do that, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to reiterate, like, I think the, the times where I can actually be an adult and I can like go to someone's house and, and hang out. Like, I feel like I've done that with most of you at some point in the last like year um, and just like be a person and like have adult conversations without this. <laughs> num, num. <laughs> um, it's been really nice. It's been an opportunity for me to just like remember myself, um, especially as a new-ish parent. Um, Cause yeah, they take up a lot of your energy and space and, and capacity. Um, but I think we don't really, Every time I talk, this is what she wants to say. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I just want to reiterate that. Um, Bina, you have your hand up, and I don't know if uh, Jay and Stacey want to add anything before we move on. For sure. Um, so there are a number of things. One thing, though, I want to just very publicly thank you, Aruna. When we were about to foster an almost newborn, and we, so we were fostering a five-year-old and a four-year-old and then uh, we were asked whether or not we would be able to take care of a newborn who was in the NICU um, who had been exposed to various substances in utero and was going through withdrawal and so we said of course and I put out a message saying hey does anybody have like new baby stuff because you know, we were kind of all set for the school-aged kids, but we had no baby things. And Aruna, you, while you were pregnant, <laughs> um, just did a call out to community and you were connected in a very different way than we were. And I am so grateful. So since then, we've had five other babies in this house and they've all used those things. And it just, that kind of community Organizing is also incredibly wonderful. And it's been very disconcerting having, so I'm like, I feel super old some days, I have to say. Like I'm old, I'm, I'm now <clears throat> over 50. <laughs> and, um, and so I didn't think that I would be surrounded by divers again in this particular way. And to be doing it where we don't know like when kids are gonna come and that kind of stuff. Right now we have, and we're taking care of another infant who um, has an acquired brain injury, uh, who is G-tube fed, who has cerebral palsy, who has, uh, you know, medical complexities. Um, and then the little guy who's gonna stay with us is almost two and talks constantly and also makes that yum, 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 yum noise. He sings while he eats and it's lovely, <laughs> um, but hilarious. Um, anyway, I just, I think that taking care of yourself is so important, but taking care of babies, other people's babies, where they might be going back to them or might not, during COVID has been nerve wracking. Um, and so it's meant doing uh, access visits on video from our living room. So having, uh, having a very different interaction with the kids' parents um, than we would otherwise, um, which has been amazing in the, our little guys, uh, case because we were able to develop a relationship with his dad in particular uh, through the fact that he was in our living room on the computer three times a week. And so we were able to do that. Um, but it's also been really hard because we haven't, um, we haven't seen our families very much. Um, my, my parents are older. Um, if the kids have complexities then we have really isolated ourselves physically from people. Um, because the idea of a kid in our care getting COVID was really terrifying for us. 
um, we moved so we could have a backyard because we were freaked out by trying to navigate our very densely populated area with kids who we didn't know what was going to happen if anybody got sick. Um, and um, and through fostering, we also don't get to say like there's uh, relief homes and relief care, but we don't know the other foster parents, right? And so the one of the first times that we were moving, so we used um, a relief home for two kids under two. And then it turned out that when we picked up the kids after the weekend, they had let them cry it out, which we never did. And so the one kid was hoarse from crying so much, right? Which was heartbreaking. And I was like, we're never gonna you know, do relief ever again, which is also kind of impossible. Um, and especially during COVID where we couldn't even say to our friends very easily, come and hang out with the kids, we need a break. Um, and so that's been, I think that sometimes taking care of ourselves can mean lots of different ways. Like my partner and I have needed to say, I need a break, <laughs> right? And so I'm super lucky that we are doing this together and it's been really hard sometimes, but it's also been pretty wonderful. Um, and the other thing I want to say is ironically, after all of my agonizing over, oh, any kid that I raise should maybe have a similar background to me, um, which is a very embodied thing, um, like the kids, kids that I've helped raise are white, uh, black and Chinese, South Asian, East Asian and German and, and you know, now Turkish and Scottish. And so the whole idea of having to be connected in that particular way is, I mean, it's in so many ways ridiculous. And then also there is a little part of me though that kind of wishes that that could be true. You know, so um, yeah, it's just, and because we can't post photos of kids that we're fostering, there's also this huge part of our lives that nobody knows about on social media, nobody knows about in lots of cases. Um, and so it's always like that complicated thing about where stories are inadvertently erased, right? And how we can take up space to hold those realities um, and so we're still figuring that out. I think we're always going to be figuring that out. But it is really hard to say. Mama. <laughs> no, it's okay. But to say, like, we have had 12 kids deeply intensely in our lives. And very few people have met them. Right? So it's, uh, it's okay. anyway, there's some complexity in that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think that often people, you want more, okay. Often people don't talk about the realities of fostering and adoption and what that looks like. And, and particularly fostering, I know a lot of like queer and trans folks in other sessions too, we had a whole session on adoption and fostering Mama. where people were like, I wanna foster, what does that look like? You know, and, and we don't talk about, you know, you can't post pictures. You can't actually gather that community of support when you're actually not allowed to show that you have these people with you, you know, like that's really hard. Um, yeah. So thank you for sharing that piece. I think that's often not a conversation people are having around uh, queer families and what that looks like. Um, thank goodness for unicorn onesies so I can take pictures of them and not have them be very <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Stacia and Jay, well, we're gonna actually, we're coming to time soon. So we have about 10 more minutes. So if um, Jay and Stacia wanna add anything, um, good things, bad things, advice, anything you wanted to add. And then we'll get into about 15 minutes of uh, Q and A. Nice. Um, I was just thinking about what you said, Bina, because um, so my my adoptive parents were foster parents, and they had 62 children before they decided to adopt um, me. Um, and you know, just thinking about how that shapes people's perception and conceptions of like family and community and, and, and how that changed, I suppose, my experience as a transracial adoptee, because I, now that I'm engaged with lots of 
um, transracial adopted transracially adopted adults, I realized how different my journey was in that because of the fact that my parents had fostered so many children from so many different life experiences and circumstances and um, and my my siblings um, my adopted siblings are older than me um, so they actually remember those children and stayed in contact with those um, those 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 adults <laughs> now um, and what that what that does so I just yeah I just really wanted to say that I appreciate you bringing that in because I think I do think that there's you know when you talk to people about it and then people are like wow I just didn't know that that's what fostering is like or they just like it's just not a story and or a, that you hear it's not and yet lots of folks are doing it right and um, so yeah I, I think that the only comment that I wanted to share was just that um, I feel like in lots of ways, um, so when I, my first born was born, um, we were, we had decided to intentionally co-parent um, after quite a lot of conversations. And I moved to Ottawa for us to like begin that journey. Um, and we were very good friends who had been in a relationship, broke up, years had gone by, and then we decided to co-parent. Um, and then at, when, he, when he was about two, I started to develop um, autoimmune issues and symptoms and started to get very, very ill. Um, but before that was so able-bodied and that peppy person with like their child in a backpack going to do their groceries and all these kinds of things. Um, and I feel like in a lot of ways, the process of parenting with chronic illness taught me so many important lessons around how to um, lean, like lean, I guess, on people and lean with people and be with people. And I, you know, at one point I was very ill and had a care team. And so people were having to come into my home and people were interacting with my child. Um, and I was having to explain and dialogue and chat about what has happened, this is our life and this is what our life is like. And this is, you know, and all of those people are still very much connected to to him and I think um, that really meant that as it turned out, like by the time I had two more children, it's like, it was so different. Cause I think I went in with a different, you know, I moved to, to have my first child. So I didn't actually know anybody when he was a baby and I was isolated and had some, was very depressed and was just struggling, I think with the isolation and loneliness of moving to a new city um, and then you know, years later, I, I'd had like a care team and community and someone was like, I'm here at 7.45 a.m. to come and ride your ride bikes with your child to, to school because I couldn't walk. And so, you know, I think um, talking to them about what that is has taught them a very queer experience of growing and being on the planet, whether they are queer or not, right? Like they, that they just, it's a very queer experience to do that. And I think um, definitely within my family members, the ones that are not in queer community or are straight, um, they are con in complete awe of, at the learnings that they get to bear witness to in that sense. So I, I think, um, I really hear what you what you said, Vashti, about intentionality and thinking about what what does that look like and what what does what does a sort of a heart centered or a like a you know um, journey look like for me and what does that mean and how do I model because we are teach like I mean I learned a lot of things about parenting you do, where do we learn them who who are the first parents we see right like who's modeling that for us so if it's crappy. And we've got to redo it, you know. Then you're gonna to have to ask, and you're gonna to have to look around, right? Like it's, it's either that was a good, or eh, not so much. Let's try again, you know. Let's see. Um, so yeah, I just was thinking about thinking about that because I think in a lot of ways I'm very much um, in gratitude for very significant pieces that I was able to receive from my parents there's also some really significant pieces that I was like oh goodness gracious I'm gonna have to do a bunch of healing before I can think about how to like pass on some good good things 
to these small people. Um, and, and, you know, I think um, you said, um, someone said something about needing to take a minute and, you know, like just in the context of being triggered. And I feel like that's like the story of my life where I'm all like, hmm, like I'm just sitting there like just like a whole different, a whole different process that I have to go to to be like, I don't think that's the answer. I'm gonna have to think on that for a second, guys. <laughs> like, <I'm just> like, <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. So yeah, I appreciate, I just really appreciate the opportunity to talk about these things and um, yeah, this is really amazing. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jay, I, I wanna hear uh, what you have to say and also some thoughts that you have. Um, well, as a, as a, as a as a parent with a baby, I think my my advice will be is when having a little kid, being in 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 the in the thick of things, <laughs> is to listen to your kid. Don't let anyone tell you, uh, you know, sleep train. If you le sleep training works for you, do it. If it doesn't work for you, don't do it. Um, you know really listen uh your kids will tell you everything they need um you know that they, they'll tell you the, the pronouns that they want they'll tell you what gender they want to be called uh or that they identify with how they want to express and i think you're you're your kid's biggest advocate uh you know uh, advocate for them um you know let them if you need to go to school and talk to their teacher to be like, you know, my kid, this is how my kid is, this is what my kid needs, you know, that's, 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 I think that's your job as a parent, um, you know, being present. Um, it's definitely been something that I, I feel like I had to do more, uh, especially in the social media uh, way of being. Um, and, I, and, I, and I like that what you said Aruna, about like, you know, if you don't have kids in your life, like what, what are the things that you can do? And I think like, go to your friend's house and hold their babies. <laughs> really hold their babies. Don't ask, don't be afraid. Just hold their babies and just be like, can I hold your baby? And, you know, make sure that all the, you follow the COVID things and really like hold their babies and, you know, maybe take them for a walk. And for parents, let other people hold your baby. Like, I know there's a lot of protection there, especially when they're tiny and you're like, oh my God, what, you know, uh, definitely like let other people hold your baby. And um, I don't know, I think I think parenting, it, it's, it's really hard. And I was, I don't know, but I was thinking a lot about that question that you ask about like, what do you love like why you wanted to be a parent or why you wanted to be a parent I'm like I had no idea <laughs> uh, I have no idea and I was like I guess if I would have asked that question myself maybe I wouldn't have kids I don't know but <laughs> I was like I just wanted to have them <laughs> um, and I it was just like an instinct to me like I really just really wanted to I just had this love in me that I wanted to give it to someone and I felt like kids were probably the the people that I wanted to do it with so I don't know that's all I have to say <laughs> I love that thank you um yeah I feel like um just to add like a little piece before we get into question answer if folks have questions that they want to ask please uh you can start putting your hands up now or you can write in the chat um and um, for me, I think that like the, the advice that I would also, I think that's a really great point, Jay, about like parents, you know, it's okay to let people hold your baby to come over to like take care of you, um, to be a part of your life. I think that what capitalism does is it really silos us, right? Um, it really separates us, even in queer community. I feel like I've had, I've had friendships end, I've had friendships get better stronger but i have had a lot of friendships kind of dissipate and like not be able to make it through that because people just don't know how to show up for you anymore um because you're not that fun like cool person who can like hang out until like 1 a.m in the morning um or i need people to be quiet when they're over because they're sleeping um or like i have this rowdy ass toddler now who wants to scream in a restaurant and i can't take her <laughs> um so <laughs> um yeah and, and i think that see every time we talk or, or someone that can like 
Keep up with the conversation while you like walk away and then like <laughs> okay, what were you saying again? Could you like Yeah, and just patience, having patience, you no know, parents. We're going through a lot on top of taking care of a whole other ass person. Um Okay, come, you want to talk? Come, come, come. And I think for me, like another piece of it also is like a huge difference that I made even during the peak of COVID. I still let friends of mine who wanted to be a part of Serena's life, like take her in a stroller with masks. You know, they didn't interact with her at all, but when she was really little, like they took her for walks, you know? They like, they walked around the distillery district with her and like gave her a bottle once in a while. And, and that allowed for me to like have some time off, but also allowed for them to build connection with her. Cause for me, I, I like, I want her to have a connection with all the people in my life and in her life. Yeah. Anyways, um, let's get into Q and A. Um, if anybody has questions, uh, please feel free to put your hands up or write in the chat. Um, and uh, in the meantime, while we're waiting, if uh, Bina or Bashi or Fatima have uh, any really short advice that they want to give. Um, I, I just wanted to say um, that m uh, my partner just sent me a message that uh, they're on their way home and it's like, um, so he's asking for Baba and that mama. So sometimes he calls us this mama and that mama, which is hopefully not the permanent names because <laughs> when you're that mama, you feel a little bit. <laughs> anyway, he changes it up. But um, when they do come home, I might need to leave because he's very sleepy so sorry it's all good yeah um so yeah last call for any questions and if there's not then i would love to hear some last minute advice Hi, Mama. Mama. Before you leave, um while we're waiting um and also for fatima and bashti if anybody and any of the panelists if you guys have anything that you wanted to Hi. add you know what i was thinking when you were just talking looking i was thinking about how I didn't really anticipate when I became a parent that I was just going to have to like that the only answer to people's questions sometimes was just no, <laughs> just, just no, you know, like where people are like, oh, you know, so like that friend who's like, yeah, I've got to come over, but then they're the friend who doesn't hold the babies, doesn't really like, just doesn't know how to talk to you while like someone's screaming in your face. They don't, they're just, they just wait, right? Like they just wait. So then they're just waiting the whole time. You can watch their visible frustration. And then they're like, do you have any time? Like, do you have time where you could have a good, like, catch up? But when they say catch up on the phone, they actually mean like the long kind of like couple of hours of talking. And then I, and then one day realizing like, no, <laughs> you know what? Just, nope. Good luck. <laughs> you know, <like> that's, it. <laughs> that's it, you know? And like still like you know you care I, I cared about I cared about them love this person but I was just like actually I don't see I don't see how the puzzle pieces fit just now and um hopefully that will shift but it's not shifting right now so rather than add to my already like sort of hectic you know way of you know hectic life with with three kids I'd rather just wait so connect later and just kind of have trust that if we're going to connect later, we're going to connect later. But I couldn't really have another time where we hang out. And I, the whole time I'm, cause like, you know, sometimes when you're someone who cares a lot about people, then you end up just doing more caring for the people, the other adults that come over. And then I'm like, Hmm, now I'm just caring for more. Like this is now, this is not the way. Right. So um, yeah, I just was thinking about that when you were speaking, where I was like, yes, if you're gonna, if you're gonna come over, then you gotta like bring lunch, hold the babies, da -da -da -da, like all these things, like do these things. Otherwise, no. And and a piece of that also, oh my God, sorry. Uh, a piece of that is also community care, right? Like, how are we actually actually in enacting and like really, really practicing community care like me we talk about we talk so much shit about like community care and mutual aid and blah 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 like these are all the buzzwords now you know it's like how do you actually do it and it's like organizing spaces like revolutions that don't include children do not include parents like you're not doing it right you know like they're you're not you're just not doing the work that needs to happen um you know i, I think about so many organizing spaces i used to be i used to do a lot of organizing back in my day and how many spaces we didn't actually even consider childcare, right? Like how we didn't even actually, and then when people did have babies, they were just, 
they disappeared. We disappeared them, you know, <laughs> they were just gone. And I know that like so many of us have that experience around, like we've, we used to do a lot of work and then they're just, there's not, it's not, we're not centered as people because uh, when we become parents um, or when we're supporting parenting or when we're supporting little people. Um, and that's such a huge gap that I think a lot of even queer and trans communities still have. Um, I don't know how it is in Peterborough, but you know, I, I know you know about Toronto life and like that was such a huge issue that I we've, like I think a lot of us have experienced, um, especially in the city. Um, when you're not useful anymore, you're thrown away, right? And I think that that's like a really, harsh and realistic thing that happens to a lot of parents. Yeah, I, I think like, uh, you know, as a person that is like, I, I, my, 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 uh, my experience has been a little different because I am the, like the able body guy that is like, always like, oh, let me help you, you know, let me help you move. Let me help you like fix your kitchen. And I think, uh, because I, I, I don't, I, I have kids and I have a job, like I'm not able to be that person. And that actually has been isolating for me because a lot of people don't know how to help me uh, because I'm not like the guy that is like, oh, I, I really don't know like how to, I also am horrible asking for help. So I can't blame other people, but, um, but people don't offer to help me because I, I think that they just, the, the relationship that I have with them was like me being the guy that is like around to to help right and um and and, and I think it's important when when there's like you know this people that are like chicken with the with your able-bodied guy people because <laughs> we we you know like sometimes we're we're you know able-bodied in a way but we're emotionally exhausted from you know caring uh, for other people as well so I think that sometimes you know there's got to be there's got to be a balance there the, and you know as Aries we just we're horrible asking for help so <laughs> okay. we have a question here in the chat um, <clears throat> uh, I'd be curious for your thoughts on access to and experiences with uh, child care and for folks who are past child care you can also talk about school if you'd like um, I was just going to say something about maybe informal childcare. So, and people coming to help out. My sister-in-law is pretty awesome. Um, and I think most recently my partner was gone for a week and I had two babies who go to sleep at the same time, which works when there are two of us. Um, and so she just came over for an hour while I was putting the one kid to sleep so that the other kid had somebody sitting with him while he was being G-tube fed. And so I didn't have to worry. And then, and then she left, right? Because then I could deal with the rest of it. And so sometimes just like an hour of having, you don't even have to do anything, just be there in case of something <laughs> makes a huge difference, right? So I think sometimes people think that big gestures need to happen in order to help out. But you know, send send your friend friend a dinner, um, or walk their dog, or whatever. There are lots of different ways that we can show up for one another. Um, as somebody who has had to chronically uh, change plans, cancel at the last minute because of health stuff, um, I understand when people need to be flexible around that. Um, but it also makes it really important to show up in the ways that you can, show up in the ways that are gonna be helpful for the folks who need it, right? And so I also need to be pretty good at saying, I need you for this amount of time to do this specific thing, can you come? Yeah, kind of what you like, yeah, what Jay was saying as well, right? That we have to be able to ask for help and be able to identify what we need as well, parents. We can't always just expect people to read our minds. <laughs> Anybody else like have some thoughts on childcare or uh, school? I feel like we went through a lot of daycares. <laughs> I feel like we did a lot of educating of daycares. Um, I feel like it's it's um, yeah, it, it 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 just was quite the journey around figuring out what was important to us in seeking daycare really changed and evolved a lot. Um, and I think in the beginning, it was really about finding a daycare that was, you know, 
queer inclusive and um, racially diverse. I think that was what we were originally kind of looking for when my when my 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 oldest son was was a baby. Um, and then obviously once entering like that child care system and looking at like, oh, maybe home care would be better. Oh, maybe this would be better. But then having those conversations where like homophobia would show up and like how you, ha who you're talking to and what level of advocacy and when do you stop and what is enough and da -da -da, all that kind of stuff. Those conversations I think changed over time. And then, and then having children who are neurodivergent and understanding like oh does your daycare have any autism support oh what is it what you do that no we don't like that no we don't do that oh this that like there was just it really felt less less important in terms of what the daycare did or didn't do but more about um what's important to us in the daycare like what is the environment and does that environment fit with our um with our, our core values or does it fit with what we're hoping for them? So like in the end, the last two went to a daycare that was like this total lefty hippied out daycare where you'd go in and you'd see all these toddlers in diapers like painting on easels to like Black Sabbath and do something like it was, you know, whatever that turned out to be the good spot for those two. Right. And so that's what it was. That's not how it was for the for the first one. And I feel like it was, um, you know, it was a, a more of a struggle. But I think um, access to child care that works for your family is as is, is, is diverse and all over the place as families. Right. Like it's just it really, really so depends on what you need and what you want to look for and and where you live right like geography and what is available to you and all that kind of thing like lots of people do end up going with very informal child care setups that work amazing for families because what is available in the systems where they live isn't suitable so um yeah anybody else on the child care question or, or even if you want to talk about school um uh, i i think Oh, sorry, Vina. Do you want to say something? I... Is that okay, really quickly? And then I'll stop talking. Um, yeah, no, it's okay. Um, I think that so finding queer positive or queer accepting um, childcare in 1993 was ridiculous. And the um, like explaining that we weren't partners, but we were parent anyway, it was completely nonsensical but now like trying to figure stuff out with foster kids where like even with schools they have no idea like it's it's as if nobody has ever been there who's have a family that's different so they can barely understand that we're two moms and then uh because so much in school is all about families right that's how you talk to kids about everyday realities and stuff but if there are kids who are not with their families and who call the people that they live with different names, um, they are so triggered almost all of the time because so much stuff in classrooms is about very normative families. And then even if there's awareness of queer stuff or different cultural things, there still isn't awareness of foster families. Um, and, and so I think that that gets really complicated. So. Uh, for us, it's really important to then be like, I'm really grateful that Helena is a child and youth worker who did, did stuff in the TDSB, because at least she then knows some of the systems that you need to navigate to get kids the supports they need if they are, you know, oh, honey, I'm coming. Uh, sorry, uh, actively experiencing trauma and, um, and have learning differences and, and act out because quite honestly, they've been through a lot of shit. Right. So um, I think that it's it's again really complex to try to advocate for the kinds of things that kids need if you don't even know what they need when they first come to your home. But you know, we'll keep trying. Thank you for sharing, Bina. I know you have to leave, so uh, feel free to step out. But thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I am so appreciative. You folks are amazing. I am so grateful to know you. So much love. So much love to you and your family. Um, Jay, did you want to go ahead and um, 
Bashi and Fatima, let us know if you have anything you wanted to add. Um, I just wanna I just wanna say real quick with the with the daycare stuff, like I, I feel that you know, living in this in this small t like city, I I found that I have to pick like what's what what can I work with? <laughs> Cause like if he, something is like queer, then they're racist. And if it's some like they'll say if it's some they sometimes say the the very nuclear thinking and they will say something about to Frankie that is like inappropriate when it comes to like branded family or so I I think I think you need to like figure for me it was like figure out like what Frankie needs. Frankie loves nature, going out, doing things. And then from there I was like, okay, now I need to like figure out you know, we had to do a lot of education in, in Frankie school surrounding trans stuff, uh, genderqueer, blended family. We had to go and meet with them and, you know, like me, my partner and her mom and be like, okay, these are the people like you need to treat my wife as Fra like Frankie's, one of Frankie's parents. Um, and that was like, because they would just like ignore, ignore Madeline completely. Uh, which was very offensive as like, you know, an indigenous woman, <laughs> you know, and a woman of color, like going into this like very white space and people not giving her the respect. Um, so like, so I think that, yeah, like, I think, I think it's very, it's like what, where you can find and what you can work with and what you, you know, and, and sometimes you just kind of have to educate, which is a lot of work, but. Ashley Fatima, did you want to add anything? Um, yes. So we, um, we were actually quite fortunate in terms of um, the administration at our kids' school. There, um, when our, when our daughter started kindergarten, I'd say about fifty percent of the staff at the school um, was queer. Um, um, unfortunately, the school they go to, I'd say 95% of the kids are white. And um, um, like upper middle, middle class, or up, up, like, like middle class, middle up, like upper, like within that, you know, so rich white kids, essentially, is majority of who is at school. So there was a lot um, within the student population. Um, we thought when we were, you know, going in to do the registration with I Shani, when we were starting kindergarten, we were like, you know, we're two moms and they're like, okay. There wasn't, um, we, 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 had, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't um, experience any kind of, um, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the, it wasn't it wasn't a thing. The fact that we were too small yeah. wasn't a thing. But the point of like class and curriculum, especially in elementary school, being very focused on the nuclear family is very real. And so, but um, but and but the nuclear the heteronormative nuclear family, right? So we had to like but the kids. So like Mother's Day and Father's Day was Mother's Day and Mama's Day in our house and. At, in the classroom so like we insisted that this was like when these kinds of activities and arts projects and whatever are done so that they can bring home a gift that it be appropriately done for our yeah. kids right so that was incorporated and we were lucky that there wasn't a wall there we were mm -hmm. able to have those conversations and and i and um i think also like a, 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 a big part of it too is that from when our kids were very young like well before they started school um we talked about what family is right and how there are like families can come in all kinds of different um forms so when our kids started school they didn't feel any ways about being like dad's not mom and done let's just move on now all right um and i remember one i'm Specifically, when Aishani was in grade three, um, there was a conversation that her teacher was having around moms and dads, 
and Aishani got really upset. And she came home and told us about it. And so when we talked to her about it, for her it wasn't that, oh, I don't have a dad. For her it was, you're not including me, right? So when I went in to talk to the teacher, I think the teacher was anticipating the conversation to be like, yeah, Aishani's feeling left out because she doesn't have a dad. But no, she's feeling left out because you are not including her in what you're teaching and what you're talking about. Um, and also, um, because, you know, like I said, like we, we talk to our kids about all, like, all the things that um, they should know as two uh, young kids of color living in a really messed up and oppressive world. Um, and we talk to them about it from go in ways that are, are age appropriate. And as they get older, we talk to them about things in with, with, with more detail or in more complicated ways. Um, to the point where now our daughter last year in grade seven, um, they were doing work around um, new settlers. And the, the question was, you know, you know, talk about some of the things that you think that, you know, the new settlers coming here from France have to deal with. And Aishani just wrote, what about the indigenous people? And so she just told me her response was like, I'm not going to talk about new settlers because you want to talk about how horrible it is for new settlers. Well, let's talk about what happens to indigenous, to indigenous populations here. And she just went off on like that and then took a picture of it and, and WhatsApped it to me. And I was like, it brought tears to my eyes. So it's like, wow, so you kids are, so they're, they're at the same time that, yes, we are their, their biggest advocate they are now advocating for themselves um, in a way that makes us really, really proud. And we know that like, they're, they're going to be okay. Um, even the days that we feel like we're totally fucking up and it's just like, why did I even agree to this? Because I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm probably doing a disservice to these kids. Then they turn around and show us that, no, actually, we're good. Like, it's like what you were saying before, Stacia. Like, yeah, no, we're good. We're good. <laughs> Um, they are like they're 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 good and they're um they're pretty amazing people and um I think that you know Joaquin, you were saying that you need to listen to your kids they will tell you everything that you need to know and it's very true if you just take your own ego out of it and step back and like look at your kids and listen to your kids they will tell you everything you need to know about what they need you know they. They'll, they'll try to push that boundary, right? And that's where we'll be like, no, you don't actually need that. <laughs> um, but that's where, you know, as parents, as you know, that's where we do come in. But like, I think it's true if we, I think taking our egos out of it is a huge part. And it's so very difficult to do, especially, you know, as you're talking about, you know, some of the messed up ways that we were parented. Um, and having and Joaquin, you were also talking about that, and Aruna, you were also talking about that. Taking that 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 out, right? Taking that out, it's hard. It's hard because everything you learned about being a parent comes from where, right? So um, we sometimes have to look for kids to guide us in how to be a parent. Yeah, thank you for that. Like all of that, yes, absolutely. Wow, Surya said, "Wow, wow." Yes. Wow. wow. Yes. Wow. Wow. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think that like that, the yeah, no, advocacy no, no. is like the biggest piece about it, right? Like advocacy, we like show our kids how to advocate for themselves by advocating for them when they are starting out. Like, I think that that's the best and only way to show them that like we have power to people. Come here, come, come. She doesn't want to come anymore. <laughs> Um, that we have power as people in the as a community, you know, like we have each other's back. And I think that that's also part of the bigger lessons here is, yeah, the kids are great. I feel like young people now have so much, so many more access to resources and things than um, I ever did. Um, and I don't, I can't talk anymore. So, um, <laughs> but on that note, um, I wanted to say thank you so much to the panelists. Um, and uh, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation and sharing your experiences and families. Um, it's been such an honor to like learn about 
about this and also grow with you um, in person and online, um, and then also through this panel. So um, thank you for everyone who joined us. Um, and we're going to be record, we're going to finish the recording um, and then also uh, have this available on YouTube uh, for everybody to, to watch and to continue watching and learning from. Um, and we're having some really great comments. Thank you so much for sharing your beautiful stories and advice. Um, thank you so much, folks. So very generous, um, definitely so generous. Um, and I wanted to also point out that it is really beautiful and important to see QT BIPOC people in particular and parents talking about this. That is something that I think is really important to me as a parent and also as an organizer um, to like see that we exist and we are thriving um, and we can thrive and our kids can thrive and we are doing that really good work of doing that um, for us and for ourselves and for these babies. So thank you so much um, to the panelists and to the participants for being here. Um, and yeah, um, have a great rest and of your thank day. Thank you. Wait, before we go, I really do want to just thank you, Aruna, oh. so much for leading and conceptualizing this series. It was really all done by Aruna, even though it is a birthmark program. And though Thunder isn't here today, I want to thank them so much for the beautiful openings they've offered us through the summer. I think it's been just a really beautiful way to ground the space. So thank you so much to both of you. Yeah, and, and thank you to Birthmark, too, for hosting this. Uh, so Birthmark, I don't know if you wanted to share a little bit. I know it's at the end, but um, you know, Birthmark you've ended so beautifully. I'll just say you can check out our social media and the website, um, both for Birthmark and the Seed and Sprout program specifically, which works to provide support to two SLGBTQIA families. Um, and really hope to connect with you all again in the future. It's been so beautiful hearing from you all, and thank you for being here today. Yes, thank you so much, everyone, and happy parenting. <laughs>